More good stuff from our viewers today. Stay tuned. Everybody, it's me, Margaret. I'm a Mississippi native transplanted to Atlanta, Georgia, where I sheepishly share things I love with you. And I am still loving these comments that we're getting. Remember, I'm doing a giveaway of the new crochet crate by Knit Crate, the company you may have heard of. Let's see, we're doing the drawing the second week in April 2017. Okay, here's Grace, Grace Hood. She says, hey there, Margaret. She's got several tips. Keep short strands of scrap yarn to use as stitch markers for crochet. For knitting, I like to use little girls' hair elastics, the really small, colorful ones. Yeah, that's a great thing. Cheap, too, inexpensive way. Good idea, Grace. Also, travel with fingernail clippers instead of scissors. They're compact and won't puncture your car seat. Now I do that. Now first of all, you, before you travel by air, you need to check uh, TSA's website. And Transportation Safety Authority is what that stands for, TSA.gov. And they will tell you, you can read on there to see what the latest rules and regulations are about what you can bring on and what you can't. So a quick check of the site here in April 2017, it shows us that we can have crochet hooks on our, with our carry-on bag. We can have knitting needles with our carry-on baggage. We can have nail clippers in our carry-on baggage. And once upon a time, we could carry scissors that were less than four inches in their blades. Let's check it today. And it shows us that no, scissors are not allowed in your carry-on baggage as of right now. So that's something to, to mention. But she was talking about car travel and she said they're compact and won't puncture your car seat. But I have another solution for traveling in the car too that I'll share with you. We're in my garage in my car and I want to show you this. This little thing was made for me by JC of JC's Sewing Room. She's also a member of the yarn community here on YouTube, although I have not seen her videos lately. Well, anyhow, I ordered this from her Etsy store. It snaps onto my seat belt, and I bought this when we were traveling a whole lot back and forth to Georgia, still living in Mississippi. This has little pockets and they're pockets on both sides. It's all wrinkled because I wash it on a regular basis and look I've spilled something on it right here. What I use it what I used it for then was when I was crocheting or knitting. When you wear the seat belt as normal, you slide it down here to the bottom. And I could put my scissors in here with the point facing downward so it wouldn't be any dangerous element here or it wouldn't poke my car. I could put stitch markers, whatever I needed could go right in these little things. And of course there's pockets on both sides for the model of this thing that I bought. Now obviously I wouldn't be driving while I was doing that. It was always in the passenger seat when we were traveling. But I use this on a daily basis in my car here. And the reason why is because my phone fits so nicely in it right there. And I can pull it up and it acts as a hands-free device. Not to mention that if I were to have an accident, my phone is contained right here safely and it won't go flying around in the car and I could get to it if I were, you know, like trapped or something like that, assuming I was conscious. But regardless, I think it's a really good idea. So um, that's for car travel. Okay, from Linda Ann Stork, she says, Margaret, I look forward to your videos every week. I have been crocheting for almost 60 years and still learn something every time I watch. And guess what? I do too. <laughs> I have learned so much from my viewers. And especially, I'm so glad that I thought to do this little tip sharing thing for, for our giveaway. I'm sorry, I'm spitting. I'm learning so many great things. Um, her tip, she says, my tip would be not to be afraid to mix your crocheting and knitting on the same project. You get some great results such as lazy crochet, lacy crochet edging on a plain knit scarf or afghan. I use knit square, what? I use a knit square that I can duplicate stitch a design on 
and include it in an afghan that is made of crochet granny squares. I think some people would be very afraid to mix their crochet and knitting, but um, not me. I'm an out-of-the-box thinker. I'm always up for, for something new, so I think that would be great. Thank you, Linda Ann. It's good inspiration for us to be brave and to be bold. Now listen to this by Gloria H. You're going to love this. Margaret, here's my tip. To make easy gifts for friends, I purchase inexpensive youth size leg warmers, like 90 cent, 99 cent store. Rice, also at the 99 cent store. <laughs> and essential oil, lavender or peppermint. First, I sew one side of the leg warmer with matching thread. Next, fill the leg warmer with rice, not too firm. You want it to be able to conform to the neck. And I use, she uses about one pound, she says. Then you carefully sew up the other side of the leg warmer. Finally, you apply a few drops of essential oil to the completed project. And when you need to warm up or relax, you heat it in the microwave for one and a half minutes and to start and add more time if necessary. Because you, you don't know how your microwave is going to do, so you have to kind of ease into that. The rice sock can be also placed in the freezer for headache relief, too. That's good to know. Okay. One thing here that I want to point out, the first thing y'all are probably thinking is why is she buying youth size leg warmers when she could probably knit them or crochet them? Yes, she can. However, she's putting rice in them. So you would have to knit or crochet with a very fine yarn in a very tight gauge or your little rice that's going to be coming out of all the little stitches. So that's just a quick little knit friendly a way to create a, a gift and I have something similar to this it's not filled with rice it's actually a store-bought thing I don't, I don't remember what it's filled with but it, it is extra I love it and another thing you can do is you can sprinkle a little moisture on it and when you heat it up you have a moist heat like if you have tension in your neck or something like that and it helps to relax so good idea Gloria thanks now, Queen's Yarn Boutique is Rochelle, and she tells us some storage ideas here. She says, you know those decorative boxes that you get with the little fancy chocolates? I use those boxes to store my knitting needles. And here's another tip. I use old mason jars and candy jars to hold crochet hooks. So I'm guessing, Rochelle, that you are using these in a decorative way. And it really is. Don't you think that, you know, a jar full of crochet hooks or knitting needles can almost look like a bouquet because it's something that we love. They're colorful and they're shiny and I don't know, I think that's very pretty. So I like that, Rochelle. Thank you. Now, Maribel A., another one of my longtime subscribers, she says, my tip is to make copies of any pattern you're following and place it in a page project protector. You know, those plastic sleeves that you put it in there. You can then use highlighters or markers to mark off any relevant parts, and when you're done, just use some glass cleaner, and you have a clean copy. I did not know that glass cleaner would take off highlighters and stuff, so that's really good to know. Uh, you could probably use dry erase, mark dry erase markers too, but then you, you wouldn't be able to use a highlighter on certain types. I have two types of page protectors. One is really shiny, and it's kind of thick. Those were the more expensive ones. And then the other ones are rather thin and they don't reflect light as much. They have like a texture on them. So, but regardless, whatever, you can write on them and then figure out how to wipe them off. And it's good to know that glass cleaner will take care of that. And she gives us a good note here. She says, note, it's perfectly legal to make a copy of a pattern for personal use. Now we know for copyright issues, you're not supposed to be taking a paid pattern and making copies of it and sending it out to all your friends. You can't do that. You can't scan it and email it out and all that. That's, that's illegal. That's infringement of copyright violations. So you, um, that is a copyright violation. So you, you, you can't do that. But if you're using it for yourself, that's no problem. Now, while we're still talking about sheet protectors, Victoria Murphy says, my tip is to put your patterns in sheet protectors and put them in designated three ring binders. I label each binder on the outside what patterns are inside. Sweater patterns, mittens and hats, cowls and scarves, baby patterns, etc. Hope this tip is helpful. And yeah, it is. Now, I don't save a lot of the patterns that I print 
because I could probably get to them on Ravelry. If um, you purchase one of those very nice patterns like from your local yarn store or something like that, then you definitely need to save that because sometimes they'll give you a code to get a digital copy, but a lot of times they don't. So definitely you'll want to take care of those. Another thing that I print and, and keep for, for a period of time are any patterns that are my favorites that I know I'm going to do again. And I only have one binder. I should go get that. Now here's my notebook. I only have one because like I said it's only for patterns that I know I'm probably going to make again. What I knew since I don't have you know a whole, whole lot is I don't separate them by binders. I just kind of marked them like this. If I had page dividers I would have used page dividers for these but I did not. So these are those little sticky things that you can buy, post-it things that you write on and it makes a little, it's just like a page divider. And I just stick them on whatever the first pattern is from that category. Why did I save that? I don't have any desire to make ruffle scarf. But I have some patterns that I've picked up that were free from say Michaels or Joann's and some magazines there and whatnot that stays in this broken down old notebook that I recycled from what the kids were doing one time. I don't know, it's from the kids old work. Now Patty Coach had a tip but she starts off her email like this. Hello Margaret, you're such a sweet and very giving person and that's very sweet but I keep hearing that I'm being generous because I'm giving this stuff away. No, I'm not. I would not be getting this stuff if it was not for you guys watching. This is how Nick Crate found me. They want me to share their information, their, their products and all with you. So they're giving this stuff to me, but why are they doing that? Because you are part of Sheepishly Sharing too, so it's, it's ours. So I'm, I keep some stuff. I figure we're splitting it. <laughs> so there you go. So, so anyway, um, where is Patty's tip? My tip is when I'm making something and I have a small amount of yarn left, I wind it into a cake and I put the yarn wrapper in the center. So if I need more, I know what kind to buy. Have a blessed day. That is exactly what I do. <laughs> and this is what she's talking about. We wind it, we cake it up on the ball winder, and then before you take it off, you just roll up the yarn label and you put it in the center like this because it'll never go back around, right? You know, it just doesn't work. Why is this important? Just for future reference, you know, so you can know what, what the color name was or something like that. If you're curious, you can't remember. So, thanks, Patty. Great minds. Think alike. Jackie Last. Jackie is another very long time subscriber. And she says, put rubber bands around those small bits and bobs of yarn to, so the puppies, like mine, don't have a ball with them all over the house. <laughs> so at least if they do get them and they'll carry them around, they'll just get soggy. They won't get strewn all over the house. So, but yeah, that's a good one. Carol Stellars, I think I'm pronouncing correctly. She says, Always save a few yards of yarn when making a garment. You never know when a repair might be, might be needed, and that is so true. I did, when I made the poopy diaper shawl, um, long time subscribers will know what I'm talking about. I made this shawl, but I am only 5'2", so I really need, I buy all my clothes in petite sizes for short people. And I, of course, followed a pattern that was sort of a one size fits most type situation. And it was, when I put it on, it hung funny on me and it looked like I had a poopy diaper in the back. And I'll, I'll see if I can find that link to that shawl. It was a nice shawl, actually. I recently gave it away. But when I gave it away, I gave away the extra yarn that I saved with it for repairs as well. So um, yeah, that's pretty smart and we don't always think about that. Uh, you know, we think, oh yay, project's finished, you know, don't, you know, whatever. Do save a little bit, like Carol says. Good idea. Now, Sherry or Cherie Mazur, I think it's Cherie. She says, hi Margaret, my tip is to put small scented soaps in drawers where you store crochet and knit items. Keeps them smelling very nice. My favorite fragrance is lavender too, yay. Now, 
I did that, and if you saw a Dollar Tree haul a while back, I bought some of that Yardley's English lavender sh soap at the store. And that I just put either the whole bar of soap, depending on the situation, and in this case it was the whole bar of soap unopened because that Yardley, you could smell it through the package. And I put it into the bottom of a cabinet. In, because my cabinets in my yard room, I know you've, I've showed them before, but they used to be in my garage at my old house. And so I brought them in and they just kind of, they didn't smell bad per se, but they just didn't smell uh, girly. So I put the lavender soap in there. Another thing I'll do is I'll take soap chips. And again, from that same Dollar Tree haul, you may see me, uh, I had these little organza bags and I think they were meant for wedding favors or something like that and I'll put just chunks of the soap in the organza bags and I use those everywhere not just for my knit and crochet but in um, lingerie drawer and all kinds of stuff like that so there you go now Kevin Lee he's been a subscriber for a while and Kevin is a fellow knit crate fan and he he actually only knits he's not a crocheter but his tip applies to everything. He says, never give up on a pattern that you're doing. You will finish it. <laughs> Let, let's touch on several things here. First of all, life is too short to be doing a pattern that doesn't float your boat. If you started something that you thought you were going to like and as you're working on it and you're looking at it, you're thinking, I, I don't like this or it's not fun. Maybe it's, you don't, it, you just are not getting any kind of pleasure out of this thing. Chunk it, save the yarn. You know, life is just too short to put yourself through that. And don't make your hobby something that doesn't bring you joy, for heaven's sakes. But on the flip side, what Kevin's talking about are those projects that you really want to do. And it's either tricky or you get tired of it. That's me. I get tired of it. You know, you've just been looking at this yarn for so long and it's like gosh I wish this project would get over with you've put so much into it don't give up both both emotionally if you've really been working hard at figuring that pattern out don't give up you'll do it and remember us when you're sweating out and you're thinking oh I'm sick of this remember we're, we're cheering you on now I also want to shout out Kevin's Etsy store it's called man-made knitting and he has some really cute things in there, especially, I love the little Easter eggs, the hats for the, for the Easter eggs that were so cute. They're, um, I guess they're egg cozies, but they look like they're wearing winter hats. It's absolutely adorable, but, but he has lots of other things in there too. So I'll try to link that, I'll try to remember to link that down there to Bandmade Knitting at C.com. We had a family wedding back in Mississippi held in the church we helped start with the original minister from back in the day. And besides being surrounded with so many wonderful friends and family celebrating a super wedding, I got to spend a little time with my own family all together. And my oldest, closest, dearest friend. The weather messed up Tyler's flight out of Mississippi, so he rerouted to Atlanta for a few hours, and I had to take him back to the airport early Tuesday morning. I was really worried about the traffic because we're dealing with that collapsed bridge repair, but it wasn't bad at all. Now back to your regular scheduled programming. And those of you who have ever had trouble when you're casting on, your cast on row is too tight. When you go back to begin knitting that row, you can't get the tip of your needle into <laughs> the stitch. It's very frustrating. Not to mention the fact that you'll end up having a pulled piece on there. So Mary Ellen says, cast on with needles one to two sizes larger than the needles you're going to use for the entire project. And then on row two, change to the needles you want to use for the entire project. Because it's true, our cast on sometimes is different gauge than our regular knitting once we get going and all. So you figure out, 
you know, maybe you have the opposite problem. Maybe it's too loose. I don't know. But, but that's something to consider. And that's from Mary Ellen Kinkle. And then Barb515. Barb has some of the first circular knitting machine videos out there. When I first got my Addy machine, hers were just about the only ones I had to follow. And she had some really good things out there. And, um, but anyway, that's how long I've known Barb. But she says to create a looser cast on row, do not snug the new cast on stitches close to the previous ones. And I'm so guilty of this. You know how you're casting on and you're just going to shove them down? <laughs> and you cast on some more and shove them down. Uh, that you need to create space between them. So after you, you cast them on with space, and you can scrunch after a while, but make sure you see space, and that will create more space between each stitch. So you're not necessarily making a taller stitch, you're making a wider stitch if you place, if you make sure that it's spread out. And she, she mentions that, that that works better than going up a needle size. It, it does work differently, and, and I would, I'll use both. I've only recently learned this that Barb said. I forget where I read this. But the other, when I was first learning to knit, there is no way that I would have been able to control my stitches as well in Barb's suggestion here. So I used the one that Mary Ellen used. But now that I feel like I have more control over what I'm doing, I can then worry about where I'm casting them on. So both of those, that both of those tips have their purposes. So keep that in mind. Now we have another one of those born organized people, the organized brain, Brooke Olinar. And Brooke's been around a long time too. She says, my tip is to weave in ends as you go. When you're done, you're done with your project. The whole thing is over. And that is so true. Sometimes we save the things that we hate for the last, but then you're ready for that project to be over, but instead you have to sew the ends in. Well, true confession, I really don't mind sewing ends in. I find that there's something satisfying about it to me. I, I don't know what it is, but it, it, I, I, I don't mind it. But I know some people, it is just the bane of their existence and they hate it. If you do not like sewing your ends in, be like Brooke. Lisa Maxner. I'm with you on this one for sure. She says, I crochet and I think the best tip I could give you would be have a white light to light your work area. It makes things easier to see. And that is so true. It also has a truer color too. It, the, the warm lights are not true. They kind of put a cast on your, on your colors. I bought one at Costco not too long ago. I showed it in a video several months ago. And while it is not actually part of my traditional decor. <laughs> it's practical and it sits beside my favorite chair anyway. So I agree with Lisa on that one. Now this comes from Ella's grandma who is Phyllis and she says, my tip is I'm currently working on my second bower shawl and I'm realizing that to show off the intricate stitching involved, one needs to be able to block it when you're finished. So next time I'll definitely choose a fiber other than acrylic since you can't really block acrylic with good success. And that is true. You can block acrylic to some extent, but it, it doesn't seem to want to stay where you put it. It kind of has more of a mind of its own. For instance, I did Erin's shawl the other day and I used a 70% acrylic and 30% wool and that little amount of wool actually helped it block out so much better. So she's right, that's a good tip. And while we're talking about natural fibers, about wool, Mary tells us, Bert, well, Burza 3G, her name is Mary. She tells us, um, did you know that merino wool is thermoreactive? Keeps you warm or cold depending on the weather. And I just found that out, by the way. It's breathable, like cotton or whatever, and even UV resistant? No, I did not know that. She says, this is the one I didn't know. Making it a usable fiber year round. So there you go. Now following up on that, Granny Annie F. says, hello, 
Uh, one thing I like about wool is that the fibers are hollow and make good insulation. So I guess I've never seen a microscopic image of a wool fiber, but I guess that's what she's talking about. Now don't act surprised. You knew good and well I was going to find us a microscopic image. Now while it isn't a cross section, it does show how the strand is covered in layers. And we all understand how layers work as insulation by trapping pockets of air between them. Hmm. And if it were hollow, then it would stand to reason that that would be good insulation. She says it's hypoallergenic and fire resistant. Okay, now I'm, my radar went up on these two things and I thought, Granny Amy, that is not true. And I went and looked it up and she is right. When you hear about people being allergic to wool, they're not really allergic to the wool. They're allergic usually to say the lanolin, which is that natural oil that comes from the sheep. Or they could be sensitive to the feel of a scratchy wool and it can cause you to break out into what looks like an allergic reaction. So that's interesting. And it's fire resistant. Now, well, you may or may not know about the burn test. Let's say you have a yarn that someone gave you from their grandmother's attic. And you're like, well, I wonder what the content of this yarn is. It has no label. There's no way to figure it out. Well, if you hold it over a candle, and I have done the burn test in the video <laughs> before, and if you hold it over, just get into the heat wave that's coming up from the candle. And if it just kind of melts, then you know it's an acrylic. It's you know, basically a plastic. If it will spark and maybe catch a little flame, then it's a natural fiber. So when I see this, it says fire resistant. And I'm thinking, well, wait, that's not right because of the burn test. Yes, it is right. It's not going to just burst out in flames. That's good to know about wool. And as a matter of fact, crochet.net, Emily, if you've watched her, she, Emily, you haven't been around with your videos lately, but she has a son in the Navy and they require 100% wool. And one of the reasons why is uh, the fire resistance. And, because okay, you, don't, you don't want anything you're wearing to just go up in flames, okay? But also, when wool is wet, it still kind of retains the heat, even though it's wet. So that's kind of interesting. Anyway, Granny Annie goes on to say it naturally inhibits mildew as well. And she says if you use them for a baby's bottom, a, a soaker, now let me stop right here. Soaker is a term a bit unfamiliar to me and used most commonly in the cloth diaper community. I researched it a bit and I found that I found this really great blog that not only explains what they are but how wool factors into this as Granny Annie mentioned. It looks like this blogger had an Etsy store at one time and the patterns she used on this blog are just adorable. Now, these, I have three more and they're all the same tip and it is an excellent tip and I know because I've done it myself. Karen Hales says, my tip is to keep all your yarn ends, you snip off your finished products, projects, and they make great stuffing for toys. And it's free and you know we love free stuff. And Wendy Maddox shared the same thing. She stuffs her toys. And she says, it makes me feel good because I'm using all my leftovers. It is. It is a feeling of accomplishment when I can use those leftovers. I just love it. And Linda Crazy for Yarn says, to use it with your batting, which that did not occur to me, to stuff cute toys you're crocheting or knitting. You no know, yarn is wasted. That needs to be my motto, huh? That could be, be a, a banner we put up on all sheepishly sharing videos where we say, no yarn wasted. I used Fiberfill when I made that crochet head, the mannequin head, because I, I thought, gosh, I, I don't have enough of the little yarn scraps and, you know, how many would I need and da 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 da. Well, I could have used what I had in addition to the stuffing, like Linda suggests, and that would have been great. I would have even saved more stuff. But remember, though, my fiber feel was free, so I don't feel too bad about using only that. So weren't these brilliant, I mean, really good tips, but I got more. I've got more about charity. I've got more, um, some are just fun trivia things. Then there's a section where they ask me questions that they want me to answer. So I got more information from you people. Absolutely brilliant and I appreciate it. So thank you for sharing.
and we'll do this again. And remember, if you haven't entered the giveaway, you need to leave a comment in the giveaway video. I'll put a link in the description box below. It needs to be on that video, not on this video, not on the blog, not anywhere else in that video. Leave me, a t leave me something, share something that I can share with everybody else. It might be a tip, might be a question, might be an anecdote or something like that. So talk soon. Bye. Link to the video with this thumbnail will be in the description box below. Your instructions for entering the giveaway will be there. I'll be announcing the winner sometime Wednesday, April 12th, so time is running out to win your crochet crate from the Nick Crate Company.